Hello and welcome to lecture number 20. Today we will discuss genomes. First, let's take a look at what we discussed last time. Last time we talked about biotechnological applications. We talked about the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, which is used to amplify DNA from very few molecules to lots of molecules that you can uh, work with, that you can make um, visible. And you can make them visible by putting them on gels and using gel electrophoresis, uh, which separates DNA molecules by size. And then you can stain those pieces of DNA and you can uh, illuminate them with UV light to make them visible. You can use restriction enzymes that are bacterial in nature uh, in origin, and you can uh, use those to cut DNA at very specific sequences. You can use bacterial plasmids and you can put pieces of DNA into these plasmids for storage, or you could um, express them to make lots of protein from that particular gene. I talked to you a little bit about a technique called southern blotting, which is used to check for the presence or absence of a specific piece of DNA. Um, and then we spent some time discussing Sanger sequencing, which uses dideoxynucleotides to create fragments of various length, and then they get separated on gel, and um, they're labeled with a particular color dye at the end, and so then they get used, those ends then get used of the different uh, uh, fragment lengths to determine the sequence of a stretch of DNA of maybe up to 500 base pairs. Um, we discussed the term cloning, and we said that in biotechnology, it's usually used uh, to refer to the process of storing DNA in plasmids and then maybe, maybe making uh, multiple copies of it, and how cloning in uh, the general public is usually referred to as copying something, an, an organism, for example. And at the end, we talked about CRISPR technology, which is a newer technology that is used um, uh, to edit or to mutate DNA in an organism. So today we're going to talk about genomes and how they are um, how they're structured and um, what we can learn from them when we use lots of these biotechnological techniques. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of what we'll discuss today. We'll start by, um, by, by asking you know what do genomes look like and um, how can they be sequenced? What type of sequences are found in genomes? So what is inside such a genome? It's not just genes. Um, how can genomes be compared? And what does the comparison potentially tell us about um, organisms? What makes genomes different from uh, each other in size, complexity, and copy number? So if we compare, for example, a bacterial genome with that of a human or a plant, how are they different and how are they similar? Um, how are they compacted to fit in such a small cell when they are actually very, very long stretches of molecules? And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, viral genomes and bacterial genomes and compare those to eukaryotic ones. All right, so let's start by talking how, about how you can sequence entire genomes. So far, we've discussed se uh, sequencing stretches of DNA that are not much longer than maybe 500 base pairs, maybe a kilobase. So if you um, add kilobases to each other, then it takes a very, very long time until you have sequenced entire genomes. And so that process is quite complicated. The technology behind um, sequencing entire genomes is quite complicated, but essentially what you use is, it's called a shotgun approach. So you you um, blast the entire genome into little fragments, and then there are ways how you can sequence all of those fragments. And then when you have done that, it's sort of like taking a puzzle uh, and, and uh, cutting it into pieces, like a puzzle um, with thousands of pieces. And then you try to put them back together to something that, that looks like a full picture of the genome. And there, um, I want to tell you a little bit more about the the technique of assembling all these pieces that you sequence. The, the sequencing is, you know, similar in in um, principle to the Sanger sequencing, but it is done with millions of those copies at the same time. But the problem, really, when you want to assemble 
whole genomes is that you have a lot of fragments and you don't really know how they fit together. And so there's this analogy here that your book uses. It, it takes a, a sentence from the um, Watson and Crick paper where they discovered, where they described the discovery of DNA. And, and it tries to show you on, uh, with, with this particular piece of, you know, all these puzzle pieces, and we only have six here, the principle of how to put them together. So essentially you look for um, identical patterns first. So, you know, right now you look at this and you go, well, whatever that means. And then you, you sort these identical patterns and then you align the identical patterns that, that occur in multiple of the fragments. And so you're hoping that the same piece of DNA, or in this case, the same piece of the sentence was um, recorded multiple times so that you can put those places together where you have uh, multiple pieces of information. So what do I mean here? So you see here, it has not escaped our no. And then the next piece is specific pairing, we have POST. But you also see this POST here also is over here, right? So the VE POST is also over here. So have postulated immediately suggests. So now you already have two pieces that fit together by putting those two together that are duplicates. And so when you, when you do that, you can ask the computer to look for, um, for sequence identities and then put them together in longer strings. And so the, the overall idea of putting together entire genomes is by doing just that. And so then you see that from these six fragments that are unsorted, we can sort them into longer fragments. They're also referred to as contigs, contiguous pieces of DNA. And so then you have the entire sentence here. Um, all right, so if we have our entire genome assembled, then we can look and see what kind of sequences do we find in the genome. And of course, you already know, we would expect to find genes in there, but what else will we find? So um, there are large portions of the genome that are non-genic, that are actually containing information that have nothing to do with genes that are coding for proteins. And many of those non-genic regions are repeat regions. And we discussed that before a little bit in class in the context of the VNTRs, the variable number of tandem repeats that we used in order to um, determine differences between individuals. So there are multiple classes of these um, repeat units and your book shows three different types and they, they're called dispersed re repeats. So dispersed meaning there there's one here there's one there so it's a it's a little chunk of dna that always has the same sequence uh, and you find it in many many different places throughout the genome and then there are the tandem repeats so those are the ones that are right next to each other and there can be multiple of them and we discuss those in the context of the variable number of tandem repeats so this um, chromosome here has two four six eight pieces but there might be another individual that at this point, at this stretch of their chromosome number, whatever it is, maybe this is chromosome number one, they might not have eight tandem repeats, but only four tandem repeats. And so that would be allelic to the eight tandem repeats um, version of that particular stretch of the chromosome. And then there are the so-called simple sequence repeats. And you see a simple sequence repeat is just, um, you know, just, in this case, just two letters, and it just goes on forever, ta, 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 ta. So that, that doesn't code for anything. We don't really know what it's good for, but we see that these simple sequence, rather than 10, 20, maybe 50 uh, nucleotides of um, repeats are here very, very short, very simple sequences that are repeated. So, like alleles, the location with variation in the location of number of repeats, uh, of repeat units differ between individuals. So um, that is where you know the VNTR analysis comes into place. How often, how many of these um, are found at a particular place in different organisms, in different individuals? Okay, so. These kinds of repeats make up a, la a large number, a large um, portion of the genome. So 
we have here a piece of DNA, and this piece of DNA is annotated with a number of features. And so you might hear the term annotation, genome annotation. And uh, what that essentially means is that on the chromosome, ideally from the top to the bottom, now that we have sequenced the entire chromosome from, from the very beginning to the very end, we can now try to understand what is on that chromosome and where on that chromosome are these particular types of genetic features. So um, what you have here are just a number of those kinds of features. So we have some simple sequence repeats down here, and then they're flanked by non-coding RNA. So that is RNA that is actually translated. This is DNA, of course, but it's translated into RNA, but it doesn't seem to be coding for any protein. So we haven't really discussed any of those before, RNA molecules that weren't um, translated into protein, with the exception of, um, well, at least one type that I can think of, and that's the ribosomal RNA, right? Ribosomal RNA, or transfer RNA as well, um, those are RNAs that are making up the ribosome or that take the amino acids to the ribosome to make the longer growing strand of proteins. So those we've discussed before, but there are other types of non-coding RNAs as well. And so, um, so they are here. We'll discuss some of those a little bit later. And then we have um, single copy genes. So that's what you know one might naively think that the whole genome is made of. Those are the uh, protein coding sequences that produce the um, the proteins or the enzymes then that make stuff or the proteins that are structural and that uh, help the organism to be formed and make cells and perform all the functions in the cells. So those are single copy uh, single copy genes. Um, then we have the dispersed repeats here. We have some tandem repeats and so forth. So you can annotate the entire genome. Um, um, chromosome by chromosome with its sequence from the beginning to the end of the chromosome. Okay, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about some features um, of some genomic features and, and uh, annotation and how you annotate these features if you just really have um, pieces of DNA that consist of all four different nucleotides, right? So when you just look at the sequence after you have assembled it, then uh, it's still all A's, T's, and G's, and C's. So how do you know what that is? How do you, how do you determine, oh, this must be a non-coding RNA, this must be a protein-coding RNA, this is a simple sequence re repeat, and so forth. So, so let's start with um, the protein coding regions. So with that, we already know that they are made up of triplets of DNA that code for RNA, and that the RNA then codes for amino acids. So the computer can be used to, to look for certain features that make up a protein. So for example, um, we know that proteins, genes that are translated into proteins eventually, at some point start with an AUG in the RNA. So ATG in the DNA um, sequence. And that um, then leads to a methionine, and that's the starting point of um, almost all proteins that we know of. And we also know that they have to, at some point, um, be ended with a stop, and that that has to be in triplets, right? So the stop, when it comes earlier, like if it were to come at a um, number five or eight or so, not number four or seven or 10, when, when, where, where it starts, if it started somewhere else, then it wouldn't be read as a stop codon, right? It would be read at something else, at the um, it, as the amino acid that it then codes for if you are using triples at a time. So the computer would be looking for an AUG followed by um, a sequence of triplets and then eventually followed by a stop codon and would say, oh, that combination in a certain stretch, maybe a thousand nucleotides, maybe 800 nucleotides, maybe 300 nucleotides, but not you know 5,000 or 10,000, that would potentially be a gene. And so it would annotate it as a potential gene. Then there are other features that the computer might find. And those are, they have to do with, um, with structures, with secondary structures that RNAs can form. And so if you have DNA that would code for, let's say, this sequence here, and the computer would find that um, 
from here to here, there's a direct um, repeat, if you will, that occurs on the um, on the continuous part of the strand that, if paired, if formed by a uh, for, if, if forming a, a, a hairpin, this is called a hairpin, um, can then produce these secondary structures. So. If the computer finds something and says, well, I don't know what this is. This must be some sort of a loop. But from here on, from, from this A on to this A, um, this RNA can pair with the beginning of its strand, or it's not really the beginning, but it's somewhere here where it began, uh, where it can form these, um, these um, hairpins. Then it might set it aside and say, OK, this is a region where maybe um, there's some sort of functionality because this might be a, a structural piece of RNA that's not coding for protein, but has another function. You will see later on, um, a few lectures from now, we will discuss these types of RNA structures that um, have regulatory functions, so they help in the regulation of gene expression. So that's something that a computer could find simply by looking for, um, for sequences that a little bit further downstream um, can uh, have another set of sequences that it can fold back on. And then we have um, so-called uh, binding domains. And the binding domains are sequences that are repeated. So in this case, you see the red um, lettered AATGTA. And there's another one over here. Um, people have found that proteins bind to certain stretches of DNA. And once you know that, and once you know the sequence of the stretches of DNA that these proteins bind to, then you can look for those particular, they're called motifs, those, those DNA binding motifs where proteins bind. And at the very beginning of the class, we've discussed um, the transcription factors and how transcription factors bind to the DNA and how the DNA requires transcription factors to be bound so that the transcription factor proteins can then recruit the RNA polymerase to start transcription of a gene. Well, they the transcription factors bind to very specific areas of the DNA, um, and those are dispersed throughout the genome in promoter regions of various different genes. So in other words, if there's a protein that can turn on multiple genes, then it might bind over here to an AATG, TA region, and maybe another gene that has a similar function binds um, that same transcription factor because it has the same kind of uh, motif. So sequence motifs can also be found and can then lead um, a computer or a researcher using a computer to, um, to believe that that might be an area where a gene is following relatively soon because a transcription factor would indicate that uh, RNA polymerase is bound to that place, which then produces RNA, in other words, which then transcribes that gene. So. I wrote down in, in a few fewer words than the ones I just used um, what these three pieces of um, DNA or RNA might tell a computer with respect to what, what kinds of features there might be within the genome, when in fact they're all only made up of you know, four nucleotides, or if you include the uracil and RNA, five. Um, okay, so so now we have um, we have talked about sequencing the entire genome, we've talked about um, assembling the entire genome, we've talked about annotating the entire genome, and we have looked at the kinds of features that we might find in an in, in entire genome. Here's another kind of feature that can be found by a computer um, by, by looking and comparing certain parts um, of, the, of the genome. So, for example, when we talk about the um, structure of a gene, we have discussed this in previous lectures, and we've said that there are exons and introns. And we've said that there was splicing, the introns are spliced out, the exons are expressed. Um, we said the introns are the intruders, the exons are the expressed parts. So we have to remember the difference between what's an exon, what's an intron. Um, we said that they can be spliced together in various ways, and if they are spliced together in various ways, then that is called alternative splicing, and that can lead to proteins with slightly different functions. But what we didn't discuss is how do, how do we know where the intron is and where the exon is? So right here it's easy because they're marked in yellow and blue, but that's just a cartoon, of course. And um, at some point, 
researchers had to find out where an intron starts and where an exon starts. So well, how can you do that? Well, if you have the sequence of the protein, right, the amino acid sequence of the protein, and I know we haven't discussed how proteins are sequenced, but there's also a technique how you can um, isolate a protein, you can purify it, and then how you can sequence it to determine its structure, its uh, amino acid uh, sequence. So if you compare that to its DNA structure, then you will see that you know, the protein, the amino acids coding, if you back translate that into DNA, would start here, and it would then on the DNA start over here. This is then our, um, our mature RNA, right? Our observed mature spliced RNA. Um, you will see that it starts with an untranslated region. It will end with an untranslated region. And in between is what is actually coding for the, for the protein, the coding sequence. Well, you could back translate um, the protein sequence and you would see that somewhere here, if you just read the DNA, you would expect this stretch to be read, but you don't see that, right? Because you, you have maybe your alanine and your leucine and you've um, back translated that into three letter nucleot uh, nucleotide codes. And you see that the next um, three letter nucleotides to here are actually over here and not in here. And so therefore you can say, well, if my, if my protein um, only has um, 99, um, well, let's say it has 33 amino acids, then I would expect to find 99 nucleotides. But if I find 150 nucleotides, then I already know there must be 61 nucleotides that are somewhere that didn't make it into the, into the um, RNA that then was translated into the protein, right? And so those must be in the introns. And that's exactly how uh, people did it to determine uh, where the introns are for a particular gene. That seems like a lot of work if you want to do that for every protein, but there are ways how you can actually see that um, an intron starts by comparing how introns oftentimes look. So um, by looking at some sequence um, sequences that you have gone um, you know, very closely over and you've done the comparison between the, the protein and the mature mRNA and the uh, genomic DNA, and you figured out where the introns are. What researchers found is that there are certain features within introns that are very common. They have certain sequences that you always find at the beginning, at the end, and even in the middle of the intron. And that is because there's a certain machinery, the spliceosome, that's a number of proteins that bind over here and they bind over here and they cut out the intron. And they also recognize certain sequences. And so therefore, those sequences can also be found by a computer. If you know the sequence is a certain 10 um, nucleotide stretch, and you ask the computer, find me all 10 nucleotide, all of those 10 nucleotide stretch, stretches, then it might find a few um, that are basically randomly associated with those nucleotides, but it will also find all those intron starts. And then you can say, oh, that looks like uh, it's relatively close to uh, some promoter motifs and so that's where a gene must be and so uh, the information becomes more and more and um, you, know, you, you, you put all those pieces together and you can annotate your um, your genome even better so i say here you can compare protein sequence with dna sequence if the sequence was not translated it's not likely it's it is likely in an intron and those intron starts <clears throat> with specific uh, sequence motifs. You can then look for those motifs. When I say look for those motifs, you ask the computer. You use a search function on the computer, and you can assume that those are places in the genome where you have an intron exon junction. All right. So once you've annotated all these um, genomes, then what do you do with the genomes? Well, you can compare genomes and you can um, use those to allow you to infer relatedness between um, genomes or between species that have those genomes. And here's an example that your book has for um, viruses. So these are all viruses and they're all related to each other. They're all so-called lentiviruses, but they are um, specific for, here's for a cat, for a cow, for a sheep, for a horse, and these are for uh, humans and, um, and simians, um, monkeys and uh, chimpanzees, for example. 
So um, what you do if you want to compare these viruses is you can take their entire genome and you can sequence it and you can align the sequence using computer software. And this was first done with viruses and bacteria because they have relatively small genomes. So you can um, take those, you can align them, you can ask the computer to group similar sequences. <clears throat> and so then you can use the similarity uh, if you group them like this. So you can see that this uh, simian immunovirus, um, these two are quite similar to the human immunovirus. So um, call it number two, there are two types. And um, so these are relatively similar to each other. And this simian immunovirus and the human immunovirus um, are very similar to each other. And then, of course, these are more similar to each other than they are to certain cat lentiviruses. This is also a lentivirus. Um, these are all lentiviruses. So, um, so what that tells you is that, for example, maybe there might be other things you can see here, but one thing you can say is that these two different types of HIV virus are um, similar to these, um, these uh, simian viruses, this one more similar to that virus, that one more similar to that virus, that they might have um, evolved more closely in uh, conjunction with, um, with primates. So these are different from each other, the, the HIV-1 and HIV-2, and they might have evolved differently from each other. When you look at a tree like this, what you can always use is this um, bifurcation of a tree. So this is called a you know, general um, a tree, uh, where you have the, the branches and we have the stems. And wherever branches have um, gone a different way, there was a common ancestor. So HIV-1 and HIV-2 had a common ancestor here, but then they took different evolutionary routes and they were still more closely related um, to these other simian viruses than to each other. And so that's what you can uh, use genome comparison for to determine something about evolutionary age of, a, of an organism, or in this case, relatedness of certain strains of bacteria or viruses. Um, all right, let's take another look at what you can do, um, what you can do with genomes. You can look at the genomes and you can ask um, how complex are they and how many base pairs do they have? And so your, your book spends a bit of time discussing this um, complexity and the question of, um, you know, that, that researchers have asked themselves about just the overall genome size and compared that with the complexity of the organism. And so um, what this graph shows you is the number of base pairs. So how big is that genome? And you see that Bacteria have relatively small genomes, but um, birds and mammals, reptiles, frogs, um, they have much larger genomes. So originally people thought, well, you know, larger genome, more complex lifestyle, more complexly put together organism must have a larger genome. And so explained the smaller uh, sizes of genomes from bacteria with that of the larger sizes um, of, of um, vertebrates. But then if you look here, like mammals, and then we know what the size of, of humans is, and then we look and compare that with that of lungfishes and of salamanders, and they have a larger genome than humans do, and um, you have these uh, very small uh, um, organisms like protozoa, some single cell organisms that have huge genomes, um, nematodes that have the same, so little tiny uh, worms, that have the same uh, genome size as mammals or very similar to that, that um, seem to be um, paradoxical. So some unicellular organisms have larger genomes than mammals do. And so the question was, you know, why, why is that? And I can't really give you an answer. There really isn't uh, much of an answer. All we do know is that um, we can look at these genomes. We can, we can nowadays sequence them. We can look and annotate them to see what's in there. And we'll see that there's um, you know, a bunch of different stuff in there, but why some organisms have these enormous, enormously sized genomes when they are relatively um, 
speaking, not as complex as other organisms, uh, is still sort of a sort of a mystery. Okay, so we're talking about genome structure, right? Overall, this seems to be a little bit of a hodgepodge of, of topics that I'm discussing here today, but um, it's all about genomes and how they are assembled and how they are, what kinds of features they are and what we can tell from the features. And so this is the size, that's one of the features of a genome. Here's another feature of genomes, and that is called polyploidy. Polyploidy is the, um, is the, uh, term that describes an organism that has multiple entire sets of genomes, not just of individual chromosomes, but of the entire genome. So a polyploid organism would be one that has, that's composed of two genomes, for example, a di um, uh, um, that would be a diploid. And of course, that's what we are as well. We have two genomes, one from mom and one from dad. But if you have maybe four genomes, maybe two from mom and two from dad, and that would be a tetraploid. So you would have four uh, complete sets. And especially in plants, but also in um, some uh, vertebrates like fishes, and um, yeah, mostly in the, in the fishes, there's some, um, uh, some reptiles that are polyploid <clears throat> um, and amphibians as well. Uh, you find this, this um, uh, phenomenon of polyploidy. And the question is really, why is there polyploidy? Why are organisms duplicating their genome? Okay, there are two types of polyploidy that I want to tell you about. Um, so I want to show you this picture here. This is from your book, and this shows you the, the um, chromosomes that are stained in blue or in yellow. And uh, what they're telling you is that this um, crocus is actually made up of two different genomes of two different types of genomes, not just two copies or four copies in this case of the same genome, but of completely two different types. So the blue genome is, is one, has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight copies, and those are four duplicates. Um, and then it has um, another six chromosomes, which is a duplicate of three. And it turns out that this is a um, this is a combination of two different species, similar related species, that um, merge their genomes into something that's called an allopolyploid. I have that term written on the slide in just a second. So <clears throat> um, how that works is that species 1, or species A, and species B, they can cross-hybridize. They can be fertilized, cross-fertilized. So, you know, a bee might be flying from one species to another species, bring some pollen from one flower, from one type of flower to another type of flower that is not related, um, and fertilize um, that second flower with the pollen from the first. Well, if that happens, you get um, a hybrid, A, B. So now this is odd because uh, it now has these, um, it only has two chromosomes here, and like the two red ones, this large one and the smaller one, and then three green ones. And um, so now it has an uneven number of chromosomes, five. Some of these organisms are viable, but they're not, um, they're not fertile. They can't produce offspring. And the reason for that is that when you go to meiosis, in meiosis, you require them to be paired, right? We remember that in, meta, in metaphase um, of uh, meiosis, they have to be paired so that they can be um, pulled apart. And if that doesn't happen, if they don't pull um, up to each other, if they're not closely aligned with each other during metaphase, then anaphase won't start. So it's one of those checkpoints um, that the cell cycle has to exactly avoid this kind of place um, where uh, one, one gamete would get these three and um, another gamete would get these two chromosomes and they would be completely different and they would be completely incomplete, right? So um, that means that this would be an aborted gamete and this would not happen except that in some cases we get spontaneous genome duplication. That is what polyploidy means, spontaneous genome duplication. And that happens at a certain frequency. And when that happens, you see that now the entire genome is duplicated. This is essentially the, um, now when it, was, when it came together in the F1, these are the parents, these are the F1. Um, when, when this is duplicated, it now has a pairing partner, right? This can pair with its duplicate, like so. And this can pair with its duplicate, like so. And so now they can go successfully through meiosis 
and they can produce a new species. It's really a completely new species, and that's called an allopolyploid that has now twice the number of chromosomes than um, it originally had, uh, although that's maybe a little difficult to say when you have to come, uh, really have to say it has the number of chromosomes that the sum of its two um, parental species had. So the terms are called allopolyploidy, that is a hybridization, and then there's um, in the duplication, and then there's also autopolyploidy, that's self-duplication, if that just happened in one species. So if I now had, instead of these six green chromosomes, an uh, um, offspring in the next generation with 12 green chromosomes. And those things can happen, and they're actually quite frequent uh, among plants. Now, you know, why do they occur? There's all kinds of theories um, out for that, um, evolutionary uh, advantages and so forth. But that's not really the, um, the topic of today's lecture. Today's topic is simply what do we find in genomes and how are genomes organized and what kinds of weird things can we see in genomes. So one other thing that we can see in genomes, how they're organized is that they can duplicate and they can produce polyploids. Okay, so um, let's take a look at the kinds of sequences that um, you find in a human genome. So this is, uh, I say here, protein coding sequences are just a small minority of the entire genome sequences. And now you have heard me talk about all types of um, uh, ways how you can annotate the genome, the different types of things that are found in genomes, the way that genomes are organized and that they can duplicate in some points. Here's a pie chart that tells you sort of the percentages of what we would expect to find in a human genome with respect to all of these different types of things. So we have, um, we have the uh, untranslated regions, those are the five prime ends and the three prime ends, they make up some part. And then here, that is the little sliver of um, DNA that makes it into protein. So that is transcribed and then translated and that actually codes for proteins. And then see that the introns take a huge amount of room. They're, they're, they're much larger. They're not just small pieces that come up every now and then. There's a ton of these introns uh, compared to the coding regions. Then um, we have satellites, transposons, DNA transposons, and retrotransposons. So we'll spend a little bit more time about uh, talking about these transposons, a um, little bit more this time and a little bit more next time, and about these satellites. Um, Basically, what all of these are is um, weird pieces of DNA that often have a lot of repetition, a lot of replications, a lot of uh, duplications. So um, let, me, let me put some text here. So what um, transposons are, are self-replicating sequences. So they're sometimes referred to as parasites, um, sometimes compared to viruses that can insert their genome into um, a host's genome. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about how that all works in the future. But they, um, they can self-replicate for right now. All we need to know is they self-replicate. And there are two types of replication processes. There's the cut and paste and the copy and paste type. And the cut and paste type, those are the DNA transposons. Those are pieces that cut themselves out out of a location in the genome where they are, and then they jump somewhere else, so jumping genes. That sounds really weird. And when um, that was first proposed by Barbara McClintock in the, oh, it might have been the 70s, 60s or 70s, her colleagues thought she was completely crazy to, to think about those kinds of uh, possibilities. And then she proved them all wrong, and she won the Nobel Prize for it. But that's another story. So transposons are pieces that can cut themselves out and paste themselves somewhere else, and those are called DNA transposons. And then those transposons that stay in place but make a copy of themselves and then insert that copy elsewhere, those I refer here to as copy and paste um, retrotransposons. They make an RNA intermediate of themselves, then reverse copy that RNA into DNA and then stick that back into the genome. And people think that um, the amount of retrotransposons that we find in genomes is so large as it is, you see this almost 45%, um, because 
they stick around and they make a copy and then just insert themselves somewhere else. So they continuously make copies of themselves. And so therefore this suggests um, sort of evolutionary age, if you will, because this organism has been long around, uh, has been around long enough to have um, accumulated all these retro transposon sequences. And so that keeps growing the genome apparently. Um, these alpha satellites are repeat regions. They're found in the centromere. Um, they're also repeat regions elsewhere, but these alpha satellites are specifically found in the centromeres. And then there are um, miscellaneous, in other words, we have no idea what they are, um, unrecognized, ambiguously annotated, non-functional gene duplicates. So where genes were duplicated, uh, but they are no longer functional. So now they are sometimes referred to as pseudo genes. So Here's a bunch of other things that uh, we just stick into this uh, green pie chart um, sliver. So um, I guess what I want you to take away from this is um, maybe two or maybe three things. One is that the coding um, portion of the genome is very small compared to everything else, and that retrotransposons take up a large amount of, uh, of space in the genome. OK. so. This was a little bit more about annotation of the genome. So now let's think about how the genome is organized, how the chromosomes are organized, and how all that DNA is put together into the nucleus so that it doesn't, so that it fits and that it doesn't um, you know, take up too much room and is too entangled for the machinery of the DNA to either copy it in replication or to transcribe it in transcription. So um, Let's first start with bacteria. We know that bacteria don't have real nuclei, right? They are uh, prokaryotic, meaning before a real nucleus occurred, a prokaryon, as opposed to eukaryon, a real nucleus. So these are prokaryotic. They have no real nucleus, but they do have something that's called a nucleoid. That is the region that you can sort of see densely um, stained, or it's not really stained here, but you can see it. Uh, show up in this uh, micrograph, electron micrograph, um, because it's um, th that's where the DNA is densely packed. And the way that um, bacteria pack their DNA is that they um, they form these called supercoils. So supercoils are, you know, if you take a rubber band or another piece of, of um, just, just um, rope or so, and you twist it, and you twist it, and you twist it, and you twist it, you, uh, you create strain, right? And then if you release the ends a little bit without completely letting go and letting it unwind, you will see that it um, um, coils back on itself and it makes these super coils. You can try that out. There's also a picture in your book that shows that. Uh, and that's basically what, what happens so that it um, makes, takes up less room. And then all of these DNA um, fibers, these parts of uh, chromosomes, are uh, bound to a protein, and that protein sort of helps holds them together. So you see that in E. coli, uh, gut bacterium, the nucleoid consists of about 100 loops, each with about 50 kb, that's 50,000 base pairs, of negatively supercoiled DNA, negatively meaning uh, turned into one direction, into the negative or the positive direction. And then um, it says here, when the DNA in a loop is nicked, so one little um, cut is made, then that can be used to unwind that loop, and the DNA duplex forms a relaxed double helix. So it's not as um, <clears throat> tightly wound anymore. So if it gets too tightly wound, then it can be uh, nicked and slightly unwound and then uh, re uh, repaired, and then uh, it forms a, a more relaxed double helix. Of course, this is the double helix of the DNA. So <clears throat> how do eukaryotes do that? So in eukaryotes, the condensation or the, the, the uh, bringing together the clumping of the DNA without making it uh, unusable is by um, producing what's called chromatin fibers. And so what I want you to remember about this is that DNA is wrapped around proteins, and these proteins are called histones. So that's what I write down here, or up here. They're wrapped around histone proteins. These are proteins. You should know what histones are. 
And that DNA that's wrapped around these histones, that's wrapped around in a specific way, it's exactly twice that it's wrapped around, um, together that makes um, what's called a nucleosome. So the, uh, the nuclear, the nuclein, the, uh, the, the, the nuclear um, DNA essentially, uh, together with the, with the protein, that's called the nucleosome. And these proteins are called histones. So that um, uh, fact that it's um, rolled around these um, proteins many times and many, many proteins, and then these proteins are condensed together by is, um, assembling them in a certain way, uh, makes the DNA pack very densely and produces these coiled chromatin fibers, which then you can see here uh, are coiled even more densely together to produce these X-shaped chromosomes. And of course, we discussed when we talked about um, mitosis and meiosis, how you have the condensation of the DNA at the very beginning of mitosis to produce these, these X-shaped chromosomes. Well, that is when, um, when chromatin, in other words, DNA wrapped around nucleosomes, produces all these um, coiled chromatin fibers to produce in the end these condensed chromatids uh, on each of the uh, chromosomes. All right, so we want to remember that wrapping prevents DNA from tangling and it compacts the DNA, and we want to know what histones are and we want to know what a nucleosome is. Okay, so um, I want to spend the last few minutes of the lecture about um, specific type of uh, genome and tell you a little bit about viruses because um, there isn't really much more space in the in the um, semester really to talk about viruses and viruses are so interesting and um, so important for you know for human life for for medicine and so forth that um, it fits in quite well here because their genome is very specific it's very interesting um, biologically just how their genome is um, organized and how small it is and how that uh, is replicated. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about viruses and the virus genome. So um, here's a picture. It's not from your book. It's from a different, uh, different book. Um, well, viruses are found to infect organisms of all kinds. Bacteria can be infected by viruses. Plants can be infected by viruses. Animals can be infected by viruses. So um, there are different types of viruses, but all viruses have uh, a number of features in common, and one of them has to do with its genome, and that's why it fits so well into this lecture. Um, so their genomes are short, they're very small, they do not have very much um, stuffer, if you will. There's, if, you, uh, if you look at a genome of a virus, you will see that it has a few proteins, a few protein coding regions, not much else, and uh, it uses that in various ways um, to, to reproduce. So just a little bit of nomenclature here. So if you look at all these different types of, uh, of viruses first, you see one that's called the uh, tobacco mosaic virus, very common virus in plants, and not just tobacco. You see this, um, this structure, this rod-shaped structure, and you see these adenoviruses. Um, they look like they uh, you know, have these very distinct uh, shapes. Then here's a picture of an influenza virus, so that's the flu virus. Um, so it looks quite different, but you can see that it has this, um, this uh, extra structure around it, right, that these don't seem to have. There's this extra structure around it. We'll talk about that in a second. And then uh, bacteriophages. Um, these are just adorable. I mean, they're, look at, look at, uh, the way that they are put together with this head and then these little um, fiber tails and then the, the uh, place where, the, um, where they can insert, where they can pass their DNA through this uh, tail sheet and inject it into their hosts, which are bacteria. So bacteriophages, the phage is the virus, the bacteriophage means that this virus infects bacteria. Um, just amazing structures. So all of these viruses are made up of um, a genome, and the genome can be DNA, just like um, our genome is made of, of DNA, but it can also be made of RNA instead of DNA. So they, 
do not have as their form of uh, genome when they um, are mature and um, uh, go from one host to another host, um, carry DNA around with them, but they actually carry RNA around with them. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then they all have um, a um, capsid around them. So it's sort of a protective protein coat, if you will. And the capsid is made up of capsomeres. Those are the individual uh, parts. Each of these are the balls. It's a capsomere. It's a little protein molecule. And those together, when they're all assembled together around the um, DNA or RNA, are called the capsid. And then some viruses also have um, a, a, uh, um, this, this extra membrane around it. This is called the membranous envelope. And some of them are studded with these glycoproteins. These are little proteins that are inserted into the membrane. And we talked about uh, membrane proteins. This is essentially a membrane protein. It has a little sugar uh, part on it. That's why they're called glycoproteins. So um, here's some, some, um, some, some little summary of what I just said. Viruses can be made of RNA and of DNA. They are double-stranded. The, the DNA can be double-stranded or single-stranded. Just think about that for a second. Single-stranded DNA, um, single or double-stranded RNA. So normally we think about DNA as always being double-stranded and RNA always thinking as always being single-stranded. Well, the genomes of viruses are quite odd. They can, they can be DNA that's single-stranded or made of RNA that's double-stranded or any of these other combinations. Your book has a pretty um, elaborate picture, you know, how you can um, put them into different classes and classifications. Um, but essentially, if you can remember this, that will tell you the diversity of the viruses. And then viruses consist of their genomes. There can be any of these uh, four kinds. Um, they have the capsid. And then some have a, um, an envelope that is studied with the glycoproteins, and that is an example here. So I want to spend just a little bit of time showing you the uh, life cycle of a virus. So how does it use its genome? So if you think about a virus um, outside of a cell, and it's uh, just about to infect the cell, when, as it is moving into the host cell, and there's various ways how to infect the host, what um, viruses usually do is once they um, are in the host cell, they shed their capsid, um, and then their DNA, their viral DNA, let's assume this is a DNA virus, um, is, uh, it, it, uh, is using the host to transcribe it and produce um, mRNA, which is then translated by the host into capsid proteins. And the DNA is replicated, um, and it can either use its own uh, machinery or it can use the host's machinery, and it then assembles and produces the um, the new so the new DNA and the new capsid proteins assemble and produce new viruses that can then break out of the uh, out of the cell. So virus infects, virus sheds capsid, the viral DNA is transcribed by the host, the viral DNA is replicated more virus particles assemble, and they lyse the cell, they break open the cell and exit. Um, so that's sort of a very general uh, approach of, um, of uh, a life cycle of a virus. Um, there's a, um, the lentiviruses, the viruses that are very slow in, um, have a very slow life cycle, um, lenti meaning, meaning slow, there's an example of that um, for the HIV virus. And there's a, a, I'm also showing it to you because it's another type of virus. It's called a retrovirus. So let's take a look at how a slow retrovirus um, uses its host in its life cycle. So here's a, here's a little cartoon of an HIV virus particle. Um, so it has the, the envelope. It has the um, capsid. And then it has the, the, nucle uh, the nuclear material, which in this case, it's RNA. So that's why they're called a retrovirus, because they have to go between, um, between um, generations from RNA to DNA first, and then back to RNA. And in order to do that, they use a specific um, enzyme. It's called reverse transcriptase. So they are infecting the host. They are shedding their... Um, their um, protein, their capsid, 
and then they use an enzyme that isn't part of the host's repertoire. So that's why it has to bring it along, the reverse transcriptase. That is something that um, hardly any organism has other than retroviruses. And so they use now the, retro, the uh, reverse transcriptase to make DNA from its viral RNA. And then now that it has DNA, it inserts that DNA into the host's nucleus. And that's where it can stay for a very long time. So I say here, after a long latent period in which the DNA is inserted into the, um, into the chromosomal DNA of the host, the, um, something can trigger stress, for example, um, other diseases uh, can trigger the production of mRNA of this particular provirus, so the inserted DNA into the host's nucleus. And uh, when it makes the RNA, it can then um, uh, produce its protein, it can uh, assemble a new virus, and then it can bud, as this virus particle, it can bud out of the cell. And as it's doing that, it's taking a bit of the membrane of the host, that's what this, uh, this bud is, uh, with it, and that is what's making its envelope. So that is the way how um, retroviruses are uh, inserting their their um, genetic material into the host, sit there for a while, and then at some point when triggered, uh, reproduce. Okay, so so there's an example of uh, another genome and another way of um, structuring the genome. So. What we talked about today is, was all about genomes, was all about um, how, to, how to assemble genomes, how to, to uh, sequence and assemble them. Uh, we talked about how genomes are made up of many types of sequences, and we looked at multiple types of sequences. We said there were the genes, of course, which only make up a small fraction of the whole genome. We looked at repeat regions. I taught you a little bit about transposons, which are those sequences that are um, self-copying and they can either cut and paste or copy and paste and move around the genome. Um, I talked about satellite repeats, repeat regions that are often found in the centromere. Um, we talked a little bit more about introns. We saw how um, much more intron material there is than exon material in humans. Um, we looked at untranscribed regions. All of those make up uh, genomes. And then I said, you can use computers to um, do the annotation and the computers look for certain features. I say here, tell, tale, sequence, motifs. I told you, told you a little bit about certain types of motifs, how they were found and how uh, you can use that knowledge of those particular motifs to determine that a piece of DNA that you don't know anything about might be this or that because you have seen this motif before and you know that that motif, that sequence of DNA um, is used for certain things, such as in the promoter to, um, to recruit proteins, transcription factors, or as a particular uh, uh, sequence that um, recruits splicing machinery. And so therefore, you know that that is where an intron and exon boundary might be. Um, we looked at compaction of eukaryotic uh, versus prokaryotic genomes. And then at the end, we spent a little bit of time looking at virus genomes and um, uh, how they require and how they use their host for replication and how they have different types of genomes um, in terms of versus they using DNA versus RNA, using single-stranded versus double-stranded material. All right, and that is it for today, and I will see you in class.